Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming. First question that I have for tonight, Mythbusters, was the menorah in the base of Mikdash in the Holy Temple, by extension, or I don't know what the opposite word for extension is, going back, uh, in the tabernacle in the Mishkan, first base of Mikdash, second base of Mikdash, was the menorah round? Or the Like you see when you go to uh, Jerusalem, they have on display from the Temple Institute, they have on display the menorah, the menorah that they believe will be used when Mashiach comes. Yeah, I got familiar with the Temple Institute. They um, very interesting project. They um, have built all of the vessels, all of the kalim for the base of Mikdash. You can go there, you can get a tour, and they'll give you, they'll talk to you about it. I don't know how many millions of dollars they put into it. It's quite impressive. Um, how they made the tongs, certain things is questionable because. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Mishnah, tongs can only be made from tongs, the tongs they would use for the coals. Um, so I'm not really sure, but nevertheless, they have over there the uh, a, a menorah, what they believe the menorah that will be used for when Mashiach comes. And they base it off the menorah that is on King uh, is on Titus's arch. You go to Rome, there's an arch, for, the arch of Titus, and there's a depiction there of the Jews leaving um, of when the Romans came and destroyed the base of Mikdash and took the Jews out, and it has them carrying the menorah. You're all familiar with that, I'm sure. If not, you can check it out. But the Rambam holds that it was the menorah was diagonal. So it's up for debate. When you go to the Temple Institute, uh, I just remember I've been to the tour a, a couple times. They'll say no matter what it is kosher, whichever way the real halachic uh, way it is, is fine. Okay, like we don't know, they say we don't really know which way it is, but either way, the arch or the diagonal is totally fine, uh, is kosher, which they are correct, I believe. I believe that's correct. Um, but as Chabad, we hold by the Rambam, and the Rambam holds that it is arched like this. Um, if you look at the depiction of the Rambam, that's what we hold. We think that's the truth. Um, how it became arched. I think somebody was sketching it from memory. I think that's the, uh, that's the, um, yeah, on the Arch of Titus. I think somebody was just trying to call from memory when they made that arch, right? There was no pictures or anything like that. And the guy just, whatever, we think he did it incorrectly. If you want to know the, if you want to know the truth. Um, okay, another question was, what did Adam and Eve eat? It actually opens up a whole nice debate, a whole nice, story. Um, I'll tell you guys a little bit deeper of what happened with Adam and Eve at the Chet Eitz Adas, at the sin of the tree of knowledge. What did they eat? The accepted opinion is that they ate a fig. It was a fig tree. But let's, I just want to analyze the story for a little bit. And I want to tell you guys a little bit of a deeper shot, a, a deeper, a deeper uh, uh, answer. The story doesn't make sense. The whole story of Adam and Eve doesn't make sense. What happened? In the ninth hour of their creation, God tells Adam and Eve, you can eat from any tree in the world, any tree in the garden. You can have from anything you want, except for the tree of uh, the tree of knowledge, the tree of good and evil. The tree of knowledge, I should say, the tree of knowledge. So what happens? Let me just, uh, I actually opened up the story a little bit over here. So Adam, what happens in the 10th hour, they couldn't hold on for an hour. It's Arab Shabbos. Other things were being created at this time, like the mouth of uh, the mouth that opened up in the mouth of the earth that killed Korach, the mouth of the donkey. Um, the tongs for the base of Mikdash were created. Um, uh, there's 10 things that the Gemara, that the Mishnah and Mishnah of us, Perik Chamishi or Shishi. Uh, Perik Chamishi talks about the fifth Perik, the fifth chapter. Anyway, what happened? God tells uh, Adam and Eve in the ninth hour, do not eat from the tree of uh, knowledge. In the tenth hour, they eat from the tree of knowledge. What does Adam say? God says, whoa, what happened over here? Um, oh, no, 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 let's go back. What did God say? God says, of all the trees, you may eat the fruits, but from the trees... The tree of good and evil you may, you may not eat, for you will die. That's what he says. 
So the 10th hour comes, Adam eats. God says, hey, what happened over here? What did he say? She gave it to me. <laughs> God asks Chava, asks Eve, what happened? And she said, the snake made me do it. So then just a little bit further, the God says, okay, fine. By the sweat of your brow, you will work. You will feel the pain of childbirth. And the snake will be your enemy, which Rashi explains it will bite you at the heel. Okay, okay, a bunch of questions over here. First of all, um, how could it be that God spoke to Adam and one hour later he messes up? I mean, does God, does Adam like dismiss God? Does he like, oh, God is like, oh, who's God? Adam knew very well who God was. Um, Another question, just looking through the text, what's wrong with Adam? Uh, like, he, you have to understand, the whole concept of the Yetzer Hara, evil inclination, didn't happen until they ate from the tree, which means he had no desire to eat from it. He was a tzaddik. A tzaddik cannot sin. It's not like a tzaddik has a desire to sin and he overcomes it. That's the bane in it, in Tanya. A tzaddik has no desire whatsoever. A, a tzaddik that has no desire, he cannot sin. So how did he possibly decide to eat from one hour later from this tree? And first of all, like we just said, it's a fig tree. What's so tempting about a fig tree? I don't know. There are better, I'm sorry to say, there are better fruit. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay, so how did they come to the conclusion of a fig tree? Only because fig tree have a pretty spicy history as far as being like, Used this as a symbolic representation of like genitalia and things. Oh, I don't know. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> um, how did they come to the? I think it's just. Uh, I don't know. I have to look it back up in the Gemara. I don't remember. I don't remember the exact. Uh, I don't want to give you the wrong answer. I'm not sure. Can I give an opinion? An opinion, sure. Okay. Well, I just finished learning this specific part with someone, and it said that they covered themselves out of loincloths from the same tree that they ate from and it specifically said like in Rashi fig tree okay but how like how does he know how does Rashi Rashi only is a malakit Rashi brings from the fig tree what what does it say where it said wait I think I'm gonna look in the Chumash but like it mentioned something about a fig tree and they took the leaves from the same tree that they ate from to cover themselves up with. right so how do we know that it was a fig tree though that's I think that's the question how do we know? Where in the Gemara does it say a fig tree? I don't remember. I, didn't, I wasn't learning the Gemara. I was learning in the Chumash itself. Oh, okay. So it should say in the Chumash somewhere. I, I, I mean, I don't, in my Chumash doesn't say it, but I'm just going through. I just have like a brief story of it. Um, okay, well, I'll look it up. I'll find the answer to that. So what are some other questions over here? Um, first of all, he's, God says, if you eat from it, you'll die. But what did God, what did God actually do? You will die. But you're also going to have a bunch of pain. You're going to be in it through a lot of pain. Um, you're going to uh, have childbirth, labor pains, and you're going to have to work really hard. That wasn't part of the deal, first of all. It wasn't part of what God said. God just said, if you eat from it, you'll die. But uh, then God goes ahead and says that uh, you're going to have all this pain to go with it. Um, why did God blame Eve? Um and like, but why does this? Why does the Torah even begin with this story? Why does it? Uh, basically, they come into Earth. They're here for like they get one mitzvah. It's just them and God. They have no yetsahara. They have one mitzvah to do, which is not to eat from something. They go ahead and eat something, and then God gets mad at them. It's a very like uh, if the Torah is here to teach us a lesson about human behaviors, which means even if you have no yetsahara and you only have one mitzvah, and you can see God palpably. You see God all the time. You can feel God. You're the only, nobody can sense God like you can. You're still going to go mess up and make God, up, God mad. I mean, that's like a quite a, uh, it's quite a discouraging story, if I may say so myself. So this, actually, this, this class, or like this concept has been going around a lot. Um, Manus Freeman has been speaking about it. It's a classic from it's a classic understanding from the Rebbe, and I was just writing, I was writing some notes. So let me, let me, uh, I'm trying to, trying to remember this class a little bit. I want to tell you a little bit uh, what, what exactly is going on. 
So what you have to understand is that where does Adam come from? Where does Adam come from? So he came down from, he was a neshama. What happened? There were two neshamas. There were two souls before they came down into this world, Adam and Eve. And it says that uh, God consults with the soul before it goes down and it asks them, this is every soul. Do you want to perform a mission for me? And the soul says, yeah, I'd like to perform a mission. So the soul says, okay, my, God says like this. I want a dira patachtoinim. I want you to go to the lowest world, and I want you, th- and I want you in that place to reveal godliness. I want that place to be as more godly than we are right now, which is in Shemai, right? They're in Gan Eden, God's essence. But I want it to be even more godly there than it is up up here. That's every soul. And they say, okay, let's go. So what happens? They come down, they open up their eyes, and they're in Gan Eden. I mean, they're in the physical Gan Eden. They're in a, they're in a real place called Gan Eden. Gan Eden is a real place. It was a real garden, the land of Israel. And that's where they were. So God says to them, everything in this uh, field, everything in this, in this garden, it's perfect. It's kosher. Except for one thing, this tree over here. You can't have from that tree. So what do they do? They ask themselves, well, God wanted us to like fix the world over here. Well, nothing needs fixing. Everything is totally kosher. Everything is bliss. Except for this one tree over here. So I, I, like, what, what's our mission over here? So Eve sees a little bit between the lines. Eve says like this, I think we're supposed to eat from that tree. God is saying to us, don't eat it, because if we eat it, we'll die. But he wants us to eat from it. And Adam asks, how do you know that? Eve says, this clearly isn't the lowest world. There's a place that if we go to this other plane, that means we could die. That means there's a... And that place, clearly, if there's some sort of there's some sort of evil there, that's lower than the place we are right now. And God told us our mission is to go to the lowest place. So we have to go, we have to try to find a way to get there. And Adam says, okay, that makes sense. And Adam says, so what happens? They go and they eat from it. And God says, how did you know to eat from that tree? What did you just do? He said, I ate from the tree. And, she go, and he goes, how did you know to eat from that tree? Now, you, we normally think of the story as God's yelling at him. And maybe, I don't know, whatever. That's one level. But on a deeper level, God, God wasn't mad. God asked him, how did you know to eat from that tree? And he said, Eve told me. It was Eve's idea, Chava's idea. And God said, how did she know? And she, so God goes to Eve and says, how did you know? And she said, the snake told me that if we eat, we'll be like God. We'll know good and we'll know evil. And evil needs fixing. And that's the place that we need to go to make the, that seems like that you told us that's our job is to fix something which is opposite of God which doesn't reveal godliness, which we call evil. Evil is not bad, per se. It just doesn't reveal godliness. So I knew that's where I had to go. So God says, great. But I want to tell you more about this world that you're going to. So this world has pain. This world has suffering. And you have to work really hard. And it's an uphill battle the whole time. And they said, yeah, that's what we signed up for. And Eve knew that she wouldn't be able to accomplish the mission, but she knew her children would, despite all the problems that were going to happen. She knew that, um, that we'd be able to accomplish this mission. And so with that, God said, leave the garden. You, Eve had intuition. 
and this goes about why she's called the mother of all things. She had, she was able, the problem with Adam is that Adam was so in awe of God. He didn't really read bet between the lines. He couldn't, he couldn't read between the lines. Eve sensed, so to speak, God's vulnerability. This is some, let me explain. So what, so let's go back. So when, why did God say, don't eat? I don't want you to eat from the tree of good and evil. And this is a, this is a classic parenting. If you want to know the truth about parenting. I, I've had it in my own life. My own parents have, such a, have said, said such a thing. If your parents don't want you to suffer, they don't want hardship for you. So whenever you are faced with a crisis or something going on in your life, your parents are going to tell you, they're going to verbalize to you the easy way out. Like, oh, just don't do it like that. Just have a regular job. Don't be so, you know, don't be so, um, what's the word? Idealistic. Just have a regular job and uh, collect a paycheck. And, um, and that's fine. Like, that's what they want because they want safety for you. But really in their heart, they want you to be all you can be. But they're very afraid of that. So they don't want to verbalize that. And that's why God was saying, I don't want you to eat from this tree. But Eve knew God really did want us to eat from the tree. He told us our mission. I want you to be, yeah, like, why? Like when we're kids in school, they said, you can be anything you want. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, da, da, da. And then as you get older, as you get older, you don't really hear that anymore, right? People say, oh, no, 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 just get a regular, just, just, just get a job that like has a good, whatever, simple, under the radar. Because they don't want, first of all, they probably don't want to take the responsibility. If it doesn't work out, let's just say it doesn't work out. But like when you're really faced with that choice, when you can really make that choice, the person wants you to be safe. They want you to be, they don't want to hurt you. They don't want to be hurt and they don't want you to be hurt. But God is saying, the story, <laughs> this is, the story is saying, God is saying, you're my child. I don't, I'm not ready to sacrifice. It hurts me for you to go out into this world of pain and suffering and working hard. But I'm really glad you figured that out because that is the only way, that is something that has to be done. That's the, that process has to happen in order for us to accomplish what we need to accomplish. For you to be the ultimate and for you to reveal the ultimate, the ultimate part of yourself, the ultimate part of the world, I need you, you need to go through all this harshness. And Eve picked up on that. And that's why it's called chet eitzada. What's chet? Chet means usually called the sin of the tree of knowledge. But the word, the word for sin most often is avain. Avain means a sin, doing something against God. Chet does not, does not mean sin. Chet means lowering, going down. Now, we usually associate going down as being bad. But here they lowered a chasen. Yeah, if you ever learned the discourse for when you get married in Chabad, it's called chais darga, chasen. A groom comes to the word chois, which means to go down. Chois darga. A person, when they get married, they go down a level. So to speak, spiritually, they go down a level. Whatever, it's necessary to go back up. Same thing over here. It was chet etzadas. It's a very, the word is chosen carefully. It was for them to go down. Um, whatever, I, and I, I, just like remembering Certain things that God, the, the, the point of the story, why is the story said in the beginning of the Torah? Is for God to say, you mean so much to me. By God not verbalizing, I don't want you to do this. But in his heart, he does want us to do it. God, God's showing his, the preciousness of humanity. That everything in this world is so precious to me. It's all, I don't want any suffering. I don't want any pain. But it's part of the process of growth. And it's what is necessary for us to accomplish what we need to accomplish. But don't think this is easy for me. I feel very vulnerable. I feel very, it pains me. I'm, a lot of times we think God is God is sitting up on his throne and everything's fine and hunky-dory. And then if you mess up, then he comes into your life and he screws everything up. He makes things more difficult. For you. That's not true. God, most, God is very much wanting you to succeed. And when you make a mistake, he feels the pain, but he's not quick to punish. He's, not at all. The Torah is full of God not being quick to, to punish. It says 10 generations from, uh, from Noah until Avram until we finally had uh, uh, destruction. 10 generations from Adam to Noah. 
I mean, you're talking about a thousand years of complete people acting completely immoral and whatever. And then finally, God decides to take action. That also works in our world and on a microcosm. But God, God is very slow to to wreak. You know, it's not even a punishment. It's it's a um, again. I, I I don't. I actually made a post about it today because I was studying this when somebody asked the question. What's the word for what? What do we say when a person does a bad thing? What, why is it so bad to do a, a sin? What's what is what's actually happening when a person does do a sin? Well, you have to know what the word mitzvah means. The word mitzvah, usually translated as commandment, is actually the 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 the, the Aramaic word for it is tzafsa. Tzafsa means connection. The whole point of a mitzvah is to connect you with God. It's a connection. What happens when a person does an avera, does an oven, does a sin? He blocks up that connection. He puts a block. How do, why does a person might my post today? Because I was studying about when I was doing some research with Tanya and everything, and the Rebbe Rashab. How does a person come to sin? Through overindulgence in that which is permitted. When a person is overindulgent, what happen in materialism? What happens is he becomes blocked up. Yeah, you eat too much food. Yeah, you ever eat so much food? I feel so I'm stuffed. They'll say I'm stuffed. You can't. When a person's stuffed, he doesn't feel. He is not a time to talk to him. It's not a time for emotions. The person's brain, all the blood is being drained from this brain and going in. That's why you get so tired. Your blood from your brain is going down into your stomach, and they're trying to uh, they're trying to take away, you know, digest the food. It's not a time. You're stuffed up. You're stuffed when you when you when you when you indulge. You're stuffed. You can't feel. Nothing flows through. That's exactly what how a person comes to sin. They overindulge in materialism and they become spiritually insensitive because they're becoming stuffed up. They're now allowing divine energy to flow through. They're, they're stopping it. They're stopping it from flowing through. And then once you don't feel that divine energy, you're left to your material, your animalistic self, your which is just instincts, which just like any other animal. And you you work on instincts and you just do whatever feels good and feels right. And that's when you, if it feels good, then it must be good. That's not true. The Torah says that's completely untrue. Don't do that. A person has to, a human being has a brain and he stood upright because the brain has to be at the top of the food chain, the top of the chain over here. Don't think with your heart, think with your brain. So what happens is a person does a sin and now the divine energy is not flowing through. The divine protection is not flowing through. That's why the Jews at Purim, what was their problem? The Jews at Purim said, we can give ourselves over to Ahasuerus, the king, we're now part of high society now, yeah? So it's a very, we still do it now today. The state of Israel does it all the time, unfortunately. Maybe, hopefully not anymore, but they, they do that. That means you're, it's not about God. It's about, as long as I'm like fitting in and I'm, these people accept me, everything will be fine and hunky-dory. But God says, fine, you're blocking off that connection. As a consequence, you're removing the divine of protection. I'm not stopping it. I'm giving you what you need, but you're blocking it. You're removing that divine protection. You're, you're blocking it. Yeah. And so therefore, you're left to your own. And if you're left to your own, like I always say, you need God's help. It says it all over in Chassidus. A person's having a struggle. A person is in the midst of a desire for something immoral. The solution is just to say, God, help me. God, help me right now. It's very hard to say at a moment like that. But if you do, you'll see things become a lot easier. That, um, that, so that is the problem of sin. That's a problem of a sin. That's the, that's the advantage. And so God, therefore, God is not punishing you. God is, um, it, those are consequences. Somebody asked, somebody asked the question, well, doesn't it say, I'm not sure what they asked, maybe on my Instagram or something. Somebody asked, doesn't it say God's flare, anger will flare up against you? First of all, it doesn't last very long. And that's a consequence. That's not a, God is not punishing you like a, like, you know, stupid teachers and stupid parents nowadays where they just go ahead and they vent their anger on the child. That's not, God doesn't work like that. It, it's as a consequence. But God is, but God has such a, the, the beginning story, the first story is, is, is emphasizing that God's feeling is so strong. He's willing to tell you, don't do it. Please don't do it. But in his, although in his heart of hearts, he does want us to go ahead and, and accomplish the mission and go through pain and go through suffering. But the point of the story is, don't think that God is there. God, he, he feels your pain more than you feel your pain. He wants you to, to be safe and calm and loved and warmth and back where we belong in Shemayim. 
Yeah, more than we want to be there. But God also is giving us the opportunity and saying, I want you to accomplish this mission because that is going to, it's going to bring you to a higher level. Now, that's not the only reason why God brought us down. Yeah, it is very common. The, the, question, the classic question in the Hasidus is like this. It's a common question in the Hasidus. It says it in Lukut Torah very often. The Alter Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe, asks the question, Lama Yarda Neshama Lamat. Why did the soul come down into this world? Why did our souls come down into this world? And he goes and he gives a many different answers. Be, it was a Yerida Tzorech Aliyah that really the, the neshama will reach, the, the soul will reach a higher level than it could have come to before. Great, it will give an answer. Three, four of my class discourses later, what's the question? Lama yard in neshama lamata. Why did the soul come down? What do you mean? We just answered that question, you know, two, five pages ago. And it will give a different answer. Five pages later, Lama Yard in the Shem Lamat. What Hasidim say is not all quite we don't know the answers. We don't always have to know, you don't always have to know the answer to a question. We, we sometimes we have questions, we don't always need answers to them. But Lama Yard in the Shem Lamata, why did the soul come down into this world? Is a is a question to live with. You have to ask yourself, why? Why did my soul come down here? What am, what am I doing here? What is my, is my goal here just to go to indulge in life's whatever it has to offer me and just do barbecues every day and just kick it on the beach and go on a vacation and watch a movie. Those are all good things and there's nothing wrong with those things. But once in a while, you're supposed to ask yourself every few pages, Lama yard in the Lamata, why is my soul that, why did my soul come down here? What am I doing? What's my mission? What am I here for? And that's what the Torah is coming to tell you what your mission is. And that question is a question you live with. You should be asking, we should be asking ourselves all the time, every few pages, ask that question. And Adam and Eve knew that very well. Oh, really, Eve knew that very well. That, she comes from Koyachabina, right? Women have this spiritual sensitivity that men don't have uh, naturally, so, th- able to see with intuition. That, that is the opening story Ask yourself why you're here. What are you, and don't think God is abandoning you. Don't think it's not, think, oh, things are difficult because they're supposed to be, uh, what God is fighting me. He's giving me punishments because why my life is so difficult. No, it's part of your mission. And believe me, God, God is saying, I don't want this for you. I wanted you to stay. I didn't want you to eat. I told you not to eat from the tree. I want you to stay with me back in Shemaya. But I'm, Really, I want this opportunity for you. I want you to be able to take it. And, and I want you to be a partner with me. That I don't want to just do this myself. I'm not going to over superimpose my will upon you. That's a bad parenting. That's horrible parenting. That's horrible relationships. One person superimposes their desires upon somebody else. I want, I want it to come from you. If it comes from you, it'll last. It'll, it'll, be, it'll last forever. That's the only way I'm going to have a dear of is that if the world wants me and the world wants me to be revealed. Not that I make it for Any questions? <laughs> it's not really a myth buster. But, uh, <laughs> that's just a great, I think it's just like such an awesome, I don't know if anybody's listening, but. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess I have like sort of a question. Yeah. Um, it's very open, so you can interpret it and answer it how you like, but like Hashem, Hashem like knows the beginning and the end, like, so it's curious that he even like asks Adam in the garden, like, what have you done? Because doesn't he, he's everywhere, he sees everything, like he knows what's gonna happen. And but he's asking anyways. Yeah. And so well, I'm wondering if you could like maybe uncover. Okay, so God didn't say great question. God actually didn't say what have you done? He said, Ayak, right? Where oh. are you? What and the Rashi explains why did he say that? Because God didn't want to startle him. Um, God wanted to open the conversation in a, hey, how's it going? It was a very soft, when God says, Ayaka, God is always saying, um, you know, hey, why don't you come in here? Where are, you know, where are you? Can you come over here? I want to have a, like a, a normal, a light conversation. God was prepping him on, the, on this deeper level. Um, God was, um, so to speak, you know, I'm, I want to have a real, I want to have a serious conversation because you're about to, you made a choice over here 
and um, you made a choice. And actually, ayeka is the same question that I was just asking. Ayeka means where are you? That that do you do you know where you you need to ask yourself this question. I was saying lama yard in the shamblamata, but the question that Adam God wanted Adam to ask himself was ayeka, where are you? In other words, where where am I? What is my mission? I am in this world to do what? I'm in this world to reveal godliness. You're going, so, you're going through hardship, hardships and everything like that. He's giving him the phrase. He's giving him the line to ask himself all the time. That when things get tough, Ayeka, remember, remember what? Remember the mission. I know. Right. I told you. And, and, and this is all part of the plan. So that, that, that was, he didn't so, say what yeah. He said Ayeka. So, so it is like, it has been and it is part of the plan to send us into like a world of sin because like whenever we've created the world that that's also confusing it's like the world was created but it couldn't hold godliness so it broke or oh. how does that how does that go all right so you're asking we'll continue that in our class i don't know when is that wednesday yeah okay so when god created the world right so when god created the world he completely revealed himself like a teacher wanting to explain to a student um, a very lofty concept. The teacher can't tell the student. Uh, the teacher can't um, say the concept to the student the way the teacher understands it. The way the teacher under think some, think about the most complicated subject or story you've ever read. Something very complicated, and then go to talk to like a five year old child. The, the way you understand it, just start saying it the way it is in your brain. The child will have no idea what you're saying. Nothing will make sense. You've, so to speak, shattered the Kali, the ore that you have, the, the content, the ore is too great for the Kali, for the child. So the child, it like explodes, you know, so to speak, it, the, the mind of the child is like confused and like has no idea what's going on. It's become nullified. In this case, they call it Shvira Sakeli, the breaking of the vessel. So the, the child hopefully won't, hopefully won't have a breakdown, but the child tries to under, tries to grasp it it just falls to the ground your content just falls out in in, in the world the way god created the world and god originally created the world he created his he created the world and then he created his he he um revealed his essence what what but the world couldn't handle god's essence the world wasn't ready couldn't appreciate god the godly light just like when the jewish people received the torah at mount sinai our our souls left our bodies two times each time god spoke god had to revive us we couldn't handle the truth. The truth of what God was saying was so, was our, our souls left our body. It was like, it was way too much. It was way too much revelation. That's what Nadav and Avihu, I don't know if you're in the Parsha class today, Nadav and Avihu, the sons of Aaron, yeah, they had such a love for God. They had what's called Klois HaNefesh. Their soul, their soul left their body. Yeah, a person was, they were so, their soul was, trying to leave their body so much, they had such an appreciation for godliness that the soul just left. The soul left the body and obviously the body died. The body goes down. So that's, that's what happened when God first created the world. He created the world as Tov, that the Kalim, the vessel, wasn't able to handle that revelation of God's essence. So it shattered. And it shattered, and it's now it's like a spiritual shattering, right? It's because those the, it shattered and got pieces of God's essence were found in everything, not just in a leaf or in food, but as we spoke about last week, also in um, spiritual senses, me mental, psychological uh, issues, um, everything, the whole everything in creation. Creation is not just a physical thing. Creation is also your thoughts are part of creation. Time is part of creation. Um, you know, things on more spiritual, ethereal levels are part of creation. And that the sparks fell in those. And so what our job is to do is to collect those sparks. What does it mean, collect those sparks? Fan those sparks that reveal God's essence once again. But now we're ready to handle it. We're, we are, are, we're, we're refined enough. When Mashiach comes, that means we, the world is refined enough to reveal God's essence. It's now, well, the, the end of Mashiach's time. The beginning of Mashiach's time is the world is now ready to really reveal God's essence. That we're, we can, our neshamas can stay in our bodies and reveal God's essence. Just like a student, if you can explain to the student 
the theory of relativity, this is always something I like to, to use, the theory of relativity, if you, if you can explain it through enough metaphors and enough parables to the child, like on his level, you try to explain it to him on his, his level, imagine like a cartoon or what, you know, a cartoon of some sort explaining the theory of relativity. If it's, if it's, if it's a good enough parable or a good enough metaphor, the child should be, be able, his mind will expand as he grows and he'll be able to appreciate and understand the theory of relativity on the same level as Albert Einstein. That's the idea. So the world is trying to, we're, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to do is get the world in a way uh, prepared to receive God's essence once again. God revealed it at once, couldn't handle it. But now through all, throughout the generations and through the different revelations of Torah, and now deeper and deeper levels and deeper and deeper and deeper layers are be, are be, have become revealed over the past, you know, three, four, five thousand years. We've become more ready. We're, our, our minds have expanded, so to speak, to now reveal God's essence. Not just our minds, but the world is now ready. Uh, is, a, is a proper vessel to reveal God's essence and handle God's essence. So to speak. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, so that's that's the point. And now the hardships, there's going to be hardships in doing that because the world is a physical world and it, it opposes that. The world is animalistic. Animals aren't bad. They're just instinctive and they just want what feels good. And so it, there's going to be a lot of fight. There's going to be a huge fight between the animal soul and the godly soul and re the revelation. And that's the fight. That's what and God's telling you a trick. Ayaka, just remember your mission. If you can always constantly remind yourself of the mission, you'll be able to get through it. I don't like you to be in such pain and I don't like you to be through such suffering and I want it to end. But Ayaka, just remember the mission, please. Any other questions? It was a good question. Whoever asked that question, I appreciate it. <laughs> Opened up a whole new uh, everything. Okay. If that's the case, then I'm going to stop the class and we'll pick up tomorrow. I think tomorrow's halacha, which is great. But halacha, halacha means to go. How do we, okay, we know our mission. Now, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> How do we do it? That's halacha. Halacha deals with the physical aspects, the physical world. And this is how godliness is revealed by, by, by doing halacha, by being involved in halacha. I'll just give you a nice little story. I think tomorrow's halacha. I hope it is. Um, I love halacha. The, the, when they wrote the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, which is what we studied last time, I think, or two times ago. No, two times ago, the first class, we studied Kitzur Shulchan Aruch. It says in the beginning, right, how to tie your shoe. I don't think we got up to that point. But it, it says how to tie your shoe. Now, the person who wrote Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, who wrote that, Gottfried, uh, so I, I forgot, actually, I forgot his name. The person who wrote that was in Hungary. And the, uh, they were sitting around the diplomats, the, not the diplomats, the government was sitting around and they were censoring, looking at the different books that were coming out, being published. It was quite an anti-Semitic uh, government. And they said, look how stupid these people are. Somebody said, look how stupid these people are. They tell you, they tell you how to tie your shoe. And the famous line, can't, it's a very famous line, it's been repeated many times, that the president, the prime minister, the king of Hungary at the time, or the prime minister, I don't think that, the prime minister of, of Hungary at the time said, no, it's just the opposite. Look at a people that can connect to their God even while they tie their shoe. That's what Allah is, the opportunity to connect to God at every single moment with everything. How we, how we button our shirts, how we put on our glasses, um, what kind of shirts we wear, what kind of socks we wear, how to walk. All these are different opportunities to connect with God. And you might say, oh, what, isn't this... Uh, this is so uh, stifling, so constricting. Yeah, the famous thing about Pesach, about Passover. Passover is the holiday of freedom. There's more laws with regards to Passover than any other holiday. So you might think like, oh my gosh, like this is, this is like, what bondage are we putting ourselves through? But the, the answer is, in order for a tree to go straight, there's many different answers, but in order for a tree to go straight, you ever, you ever see them, they tie the tree in a certain way so that it'll make sure it goes straight. Otherwise, the tree will just go with the wind. Yeah, hey, I'm a free spirit. I'll just go with the wind. You're not going to grow. Growth happens through structure. You have structure. If you know at every moment what you should be doing, now you have the choice not to do it, but if you know what you're supposed to be doing, that's how you grow. 
Because that's what halacha is. Halacha is an opportunity to connect to God at every single moment. And everything, you, you should be wanting to find the halacha for everything. Now, whether you're ready to do it yet, that's a different story, and you shouldn't take on more than you can. But nevertheless, that's halacha. And, uh, okay, a little sneak peek for tomorrow. <laughs> All right. I get, uh, I couldn't, if uh, I get a quick, quick, yeah. quick, quick, quick question yeah. Yeah. Um, about the halacha yeah. and being yeah. wherever you're at. Um, yeah. Yeah. And for times of Mashiach, like, does it take everyone doing 100% for that to happen or does it just take like the max of what every soul is here to kind of do or to um like go back and like fix that with themselves and if everybody does that then that's like kind of tipping that would be the tipping point yeah that's a very very good question that's the classic question does everybody need to be ready and everybody need to be doing it already in order for Mashiach to come and the answer is no not what needs to happen. The world just needs to be prepared. People need to be prepared. And you can't tell whether people are prepared. Only the leader of the generation, the Nasi Ador, the Mashiach of the generation. And if you know, the Rambam says is the Mashiach of every generation, the one who's fitting to be Mashiach. He's the Nasi Ador, the leader of the generation. Mordechai was the leader of his generation, the, Nas, the Mashiach of his generation. The Rambam was the Mashiach of his generation. The Gemara says Mordechai was, Moshe was, Yeshua was of his generation, Rabbi Yekiva was of his generation, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. They tell you whether the world has been, the world is prepared, and the world has been prepared for a long, long time already. The world has been prepared for a very, very long time, since the very long time. Um, we, we, and we'll study that. What does the world need to look like in order for the Shiach to come? And that's a good study. But to answer your question, no, and not even ha majority of the people need to be looking like they're doing mitzvahs and everything like that. That's not what, that's not what has to happen. And we'll do a class okay. on Mashiach. It's a very good question. It's a very important question. And it's a very and it's a very important lesson. And we will study. That's a great thing to study. Um, that is something that I wanted to work towards. Um, I was just trying to give like a cursory introductory stuff at the beginning. But if you guys are up for that, we'll definitely do that. Um, good question. We'll do that. Great question. Great. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody, please. Some of you have still not, we've still not learned one-on-one. -on -one. Most of you I have. But I, I really want to get it. I, again, I replace Sunday with a one-on-one -on -one because I feel like it's just much more. It's just much more important. Um, it's great when I learn one-on-one -on -one with you. So please let uh, let me know when you want to learn, and we'll learn. All right. I'll see you tomorrow. Good night, everybody. Be well.